morning. Welcome to all of you in the name of our Savior Jesus. In the Christmas season, we remember our Savior who was born for us to bring us peace and joy and goodwill to this world. Those are things that not even sin and evil and death and the devil can take away from us, no matter how hard they may try. And that is really in focus for us today. The theme of our worship for today celebrates the festival of the holy innocents, as they were called, martyrs, the young boys who were killed by order of King Herod as he was trying to kill the newborn King Jesus as a rival to his throne. What a horrible thing that is that we remember today, and yet we remember that God was there, and God was in control, and God took those children to himself, saved them for heaven, even despite of that ugly situation, brought them to heaven's perfection and delivered them forever. And that is the same hope that we look forward to, no matter when bad things happen or when tragedy strikes in this world, we and all of God's people are going to be in heaven one day too, so we are never outside of his hand. That's what will be our focus for our readings and our hymns and everything we do in worship here today. Hopefully as you came in, you picked up a service folder that says December 30th on it. Tells you that our opening service for today, our opening hymn for today is the morning hymn. And our order of service for today is morning praise. So let's sing together that morning hymn after we take a few moments for silent prayer and meditation to prepare our hearts for worship. God's blessings. stand. O Lord, open my lips. Hasten 
hasten to save me, O God. Unto us the Christ is born. Let us worship him. Remember today, O God, the slaughter of the holy innocents of Bethlehem by order of King Herod. Receive into the arms of your mercy all who lay down their lives for your sake, and prepare us by your grace to be ready at all times to live and die for you. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. Our first lesson from God's Word for this morning comes from the Old Testament book of Jeremiah, chapter 31, verses 15 through 17. Much as we like to point out the goodness that we can find in this world and in humanity around Christmas time, unfortunately we can also see the shocking evil that humanity is capable of at times. But... Grinches and bah humbugs and people stealing Christmas presents off of other people's doorsteps, they don't begin to match what Herod did here in our gospel lesson for today, the slaughtering of all those babies, the, the horrible act that was foretold in this prophecy from Jeremiah. But humanity's evil cannot overcome God's goodness to his people. And he promises us that no matter what happens here, he will one day restore us and reward us with everlasting life in our promised land of heaven. This is what the Lord says. A voice is heard in Ramah, mourning and great weeping, Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because her children are no more. This is what the Lord says. Restrain your voice from weeping and your eyes from tears, for your work will be rewarded, declares the Lord. They will return from the land of the enemy, so there is hope for your future, declares the Lord. Your children will return to their own land. This is the word of our Lord. Our service continues with what is called the Coventry Carol. It is a 500-year-old carol that is sung from the perspective of a mother in Bethlehem whose son has just been sentenced to death by Herod. It is at the same time a, a, a lullaby and a lament that essentially says goodbye. This not only reminds us of the terrible horror of this event, but also can't help but imply how much we need God's deliverance to make this right and bring us justice by bringing us to heaven into his arms forever. Let's go on with the carol.
Our second lesson from God's Word for this morning comes from the New Testament book of 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 12 through 19. Peter essentially assures us here that Christians will suffer in this world in one way or another, but that suffering should not be self-inflicted. There's no honor in that. However, if God allows suffering to come into our lives for the sake of Christ's name, he says we should praise God that we follow in the footsteps of our Savior and that we will follow him to heaven one day as well. Dear friends, do not be surprised at the painful trial you are suffering as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice that you participate in the sufferings of Christ so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed, for the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. If you suffer, it should not be as a murderer or thief or any other kind of criminal, or even as a meddler. However, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but praise God that you bear that name. For it is time for judgment to begin with the family of God, And if it begins with us, what will the outcome be for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if it is hard for the righteous to be saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? So then those who suffer according to God's will should commit themselves to their faithful creator and continue to do good. This is the word of our Lord. Our verse of the day then for this church holiday of the Holy Innocents comes from the Gospel of Matthew chapter 5 verse 10 which reminds us that no matter what persecution might take away from us or or any of God's people in this world, it cannot take away from us our heavenly home and eternity. Alleluia. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Alleluia. Let's respond with the hymn as it's printed. respect for the words and works of our Lord, please stand for the gospel lesson. Today's gospel comes from Matthew chapter 2, verses 13 through 23. When they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said. Take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So he got up, took the child and his mother during the night, and left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, Out of Egypt I called my son. When Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious, and he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity who were two years old and under, in accordance with the time he had learned from the Magi. Then what, he, then what was said through the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. A voice is heard in Ramah, weeping and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no more. After Herod died, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up, take the child and his mother and go to the land of Israel. 
for those who were trying to take the child's life are dead. So he got up, took the child and his mother, and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning in Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. Having been warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee, and he went and lived in a town called Nazareth. So was fulfilled what was said through the prophets. He will be called a Nazarene. This is the gospel of our Lord. You may be seated. Let's continue then with our hymn of the day. It's the hymn, All Hail You Infant Martyr Flowers. It's printed on page 9 in your service folder.
Grace, mercy, and peace are yours from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen, dear brothers and sisters. As the old saying goes, if you want God to laugh, just tell him your plans. It doesn't take us very long to realize that there are very many more things in our lives that are outside of our control than otherwise. And if we think we're going to start telling God how things are going to go from here on out, we can be pretty sure that he's going to teach us a lesson in humility in very short order. As the old Germans used to say, man denkt, Gott lenkt. Or for us English speakers, man proposes, God disposes. The idea is that no matter what plans we human beings might ever make for ourselves, nothing will ever come of them unless God permits them and sees them through. And we see that in a pretty dark and solemn way in our gospel lesson for today. As I mentioned earlier today, we are commemorating the holy innocents, those little boys in Bethlehem who were killed by order of King Herod who was trying to kill Jesus in the process. They are called holy innocents because they were innocent of any wrongdoing that might have deserved this kind of treatment. And, and we say that they were holy because we trust that our God took them to heaven as what, in a certain sense, were the very first martyrs for Christ. Now, it is true that this, their, their murder, their death, is, is certainly nothing for us to celebrate. But if there is anything for us to celebrate on this church holiday, then it's this. Man proposes and God disposes. It seemed like there was no limit to King Herod's raging jealousy. But yet in spite of that, our Lord's gracious plans for his son, for this world, and for us would not be stopped. So for the sake of context, this story in our gospel lesson for today actually follows right on the heels of the story that we're going to hear next week in church about the Magi from the East coming to give their gifts to baby Jesus. Anywhere from a few months to maybe two years had passed since Jesus was born. And innocently enough, these Magi come to King Herod's palace in Jerusalem to ask where the newborn king was born and was living. Makes sense, right? You go to the palace to ask about the king. They wanted to go worship this Christ child, but when King Herod heard what was going on, he decided that he wanted to take this Jesus, this potential rival to his throne, out of the picture. And that's where our old saying for today really applies to this story. Man proposes, but God disposes. When the Magi had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said. Take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So he got up took the child and his mother during the night and left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, Out of Egypt I called my son. Sad to say, ancient history teaches us not to be surprised by this act, this event in the reign of King Herod the Great. He was infamously ruthless and paranoid and vengeful toward his people. He considered it nothing to slaughter anyone whom he considered to be disrespecting or challenging him. Even people within his very own family, like his wife and his sons. He was, he ruled with a terrifying iron fist. And as far as he was concerned, no rival king, not even one predicted by God's own prophets, was going to pose a threat to his throne. His jealous rage would not be stopped. When Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious 
And he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity who were two years old and under in accordance with the time he had learned from the Magi. How awful. How absolutely shocking and appalling and nonsensical this was for Herod to take out a bunch of little boys in diapers in an attempt to take out Jesus. Herod was an old man at this time who, by all accounts, did not have that much longer to live. Did he really think that the baby Jesus was going to raise a rebellion and take his throne in that little amount of time? Did he really think that that many people cared about the line of David anymore when nobody from that family had reigned in Israel in almost 600 years? It seems like the population of Bethlehem might have been around a thousand people or so in those days. And so that means that maybe as many as two dozen children lost their lives that day because of this. As bad as it is when children have to bury their parents, no parent should ever have to bury their child, especially for no other reason than for the murderous, meaningless jealousy of a ruthless ruler like Herod the Great. Who could ever be so cold as to end the life of innocent children simply to protect personal plans and avoid inconvenience merely for the sake of selfishness? Let's not think, friends, that we modern humans have evolved any further than this. Because the truth is, whereas this monster Herod slaughtered dozens of innocent children in his day. In our day, millions of innocent unborn children are being slaughtered under the name of abortion, and not for the sake of protecting the health of their mother, but simply for the sake of personal convenience. And we have elected in this country officials who make no bones about the fact that they are more than okay with that happening. Is that not appalling? Who would be so cold and selfish as to put those kinds of personal plans and preferences ahead of the will of God? But yet, isn't that exactly what happens when we, or King Herod, or whoever else proposes and we expect God to just deal with it? I mean, let's be honest here. Is there any one of us here today who hasn't operated under those same motives, putting our plans ahead of God's plans? God gives us lots of guidance in his word for how we should act toward our authorities, our spouses, our children, our neighbors. And yet we can be all too quick to explain them away or outright ignore them if we don't like them. So let's not look down our noses at King Herod or at anyone in the so-called pro-choice movement or at anyone else because the truth is the root of every sin is in every human heart, even ours. And so that's why actually it is a good thing that man proposes and God disposes You see, even Herod's jealous rage could not change the fact that God was in control that day in Bethlehem. And after all, the Lord had foretold this many years earlier through the prophet Jeremiah. Matthew even mentions that. Then what was said through the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. A voice is heard in Ramah, weeping and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no more. When Jeremiah wrote that, Judah was about to be taken into the Babylonian captivity. And yet Matthew says that Jeremiah's words actually had a double fulfillment that predicted not only that immediate tragedy of God's people being carried off into captivity in Babylon, but but also predicted that far-off fulfillment that was fulfilled here with the slaughter of the holy innocents in Bethlehem. 
Both of those tragedies took place because of sin and because of mankind's rejection of God's plans. The captivity because of Israel's unfaithfulness. The slaughter because of Herod's jealousy. But yet, our God was in control the whole time for the good of His people. And the rest of history proves that. You see, not only did God bring his children back to the promised land after he used the Babylonian captivity to discipline them and teach them faithfulness to him, but God also saw his plans for our life and salvation through even in the midst of this slaughter of the holy innocents. Remember, man disposes, man proposes, and God disposes. Herod proposed to kill the boy Jesus. But God, his gracious plans for our lives that were embodied in Jesus would not be stopped. The story goes on. Joseph got up, took the child and his mother during the night and left for Egypt where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet. Out of Egypt I called my son. After Herod died, Joseph took the child and his mother and withdrew to the district of Galilee, and he went and lived in a town called Nazareth. So was fulfilled what was said through the prophets, he will be called a Nazarene. Herod's jealous rage could never stop God's gracious plan. The birth of Jesus put that plan into motion and no death threat was going to change it because the time for Jesus to die was not here, but some 30 years later. So let's not think that these holy innocents just had to take the fall for Jesus now so that Jesus could could get away scot-free. That's not how it was. Now first came Jesus' escape from Herod's sword that took him and his family to Egypt and back. Then came him growing up as a young child in Nazareth where he was obedient to his parents and to his heavenly Father on our behalf. Then came his baptism by John at the River Jordan where he identified himself as the Savior who came for you and for me and for the entire human race. Then came his temptation in the wilderness when he stood up to the devil perfectly and successfully. Then came his gracious ministry and his battles with his opponents. Then came submitting to God's will in the greatest of ways when he even went to the cross where his holy life was given in exchange for our unholy lives and where his punishment for sin was taken in place of our punishment that we deserved. And then finally came the victory of all victories, his resurrection from the grave, his defeat of sin and death that otherwise would have kept us from union and communion with God. No, there is no way that some worldly king with a jealous and egocentric vision could ever stop this heavenly king's gracious plans to bring his people forgiveness, life, and salvation with him forever. He loves you and is dedicated to you far too much to ever let that happen. And in fact, that gracious plan even extended to those baby boys who became the victims of Herod's raging jealousy. You see, God had already adopted those boys into his own holy family through the Old Testament sacrament of circumcision. And that meant that nobody was going to snatch them out of his hands. Now, we don't normally think of it that way, I guess, but circumcision was, in a sense, the Old Testament equivalent to baptism. And the Apostle Paul even says as much in Colossians chapter 2. He says, In Christ you were also circumcised in the putting off of the sinful nature, not with the circumcision done by the hands of men, but with the circumcision done by Christ, having been buried with Him in baptism and raised with Him through your faith in the power of God who raised Him from the dead. 
circumcision pictured God cutting away our sinful flesh so that we would have only hearts that were pure and dedicated to him. And holy baptism pictures God washing away our sins and cleansing our hearts so that we would be totally set apart for him. That's why even in the tragedy of death, we can be certain that those babies of Bethlehem and every child that Christian parents lose seemingly too soon simply go from being held in our arms and bouncing on our knees straight into the arms and onto the knees of our Savior. You see, in holy baptism, God made us his very own children and heirs of his greatest heavenly gifts. At the font, the the plan of salvation that centered in Jesus for all time became God's plan to save you. There, the forgiveness that Jesus won on the cross became your forgiveness. There, those promises of God that were recorded in the Scriptures became His promises to you. There, that lifelong conviction that nothing can separate us from from God's love in Christ and His promise of eternal life after this life became yours. And so that all means that no matter what the devil or this world might propose to hurt us, God disposes with all those evil plans. And he promises us instead his grace and every blessing. And if not right here and now, then certainly with him in paradise forever. If you want God to laugh, just tell him your plans. Sometimes that laugh can be more of a scoff if it means that God is defending his people. Whether it is King Herod slaughtering the holy innocents or any other evil force this world has ever known, who can possibly keep our Savior from finishing his work and bringing us home to heaven to be with him? No, not even the sinful plans of a wicked king could do that, could overcome God's plan to save those little boys and his plan to save this entire world in Christ. In that day, those plans won. And they will win every day of your lives too, friends. So as you look forward to the rest of your life until you see Jesus face to face, just remember... Man proposes and God disposes. And that is a good thing because no matter what, it means God's gracious plans for us always win. Amen. Please stand. The peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Let's continue then with the song, We Praise You, O God. It's printed beginning on page 10 in your service folder.
seated. Let's continue at this time by bringing our thank offerings to our Lord. I ask that while the offering is being collected, please sign the friendship registers located at the ends of your pews and rip out the sheets and put them on top of the booklets when you're done. Thank you. Please stand. Let's continue on page 12 in the service folder with Lord have mercy. In the morning, O Lord, I call to you. Be merciful to me and hear my prayer. Almighty God, the martyred innocents of Bethlehem showed forth your praise not by speaking, but by dying. Put to death in us all that is in conflict with your will, that our lives may bear witness to the faith we profess with our lips. And if it is your will that our earthly lives be cut short, let us find hope and comfort in the everlasting life to come, where you promise us deliverance and justice and righteousness and gracious blessings beyond anything we can imagine here. As we consider what tragedy and evil in this world can do to us and our loved ones and our brothers and sisters in faith, keep your words of promise close to our hearts that sometimes you take the righteous away to spare them from evil so that in death they enter into your heavenly peace and find your eternal rest in Christ. In life and in death, Lord, in peace or in persecution, keep our eyes on the cross and the empty tomb so that we remember not only that your Son suffered with us and for us, but also that he overcame death and the devil to win life for himself and for his people forever in paradise. Lord, today we also ask you to be with Delbert Brett Schneider as he went to the hospital last night for some tests. Please bless his doctors and nurses and caretakers as well as his wife and his family so that they can quickly diagnose what's going on and help. Give Delbert the calm confidence of faith so that whatever happens, this brings him closer to you and makes him look forward to heaven's perfection and eternity that much more. We pray these things in Jesus' name, trusting that you will hear and answer us. And we also join in the prayer he taught us. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses 
as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. O Lord, our Heavenly Father, almighty and everlasting God, you have brought us safely to this new day. Defend us with your mighty power, and grant that this day we neither fall into sin nor run into any kind of danger. And in all we do, direct us to what is right in your sight. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. Let us praise the Lord. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. You may be seated. Let's continue now with our closing hymn. It's hymn number 552. By all your saints still striving, we'll sing verse 1, then insert verse 27, and then verse 3 to close. <laughs> 